All right, so tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, today actually, today is a very good day. As we are speaking about Bihar, it's uh, Leviticus 25, and it always amazes me how when, when you hear the word being read, you hear different things from when you read it yourself. Now, different things stick into your mind, and you get big pictures of what's happening in the text. And I, I think um, in the mornings that we are reading the word together here from Kurapas 9, I want to invite you to be part of it. I think it's, it's of so much value to, to me. It's just to hear the community read the word out loud. And I think it's a proclamation of the word and the values that it, that it has uh, over this area. So I want to invite you to come. So in the meantime, in the life of Israel, it's uh, Leviticus 25. Is, uh, this is the portion where it speaks about the realities um, of freedom, of liberty, of restoration, of Typically the type of things that we need in this day. You know, so I think there, uh, there are few Torah portions that's more applicable in our lives and relevant to our lives than this one today. And um, I think we said it earlier today, this is the economics of, of what Israel, of our Father. And, uh, and uh, as we see the economics in the world and the world systems really being shaken in this time, I think we need to rely on the revelation and the things that the Father has given us for wisdom and for understanding. And as we apply it in, the, in our lives and each other's lives, then our Father receives the glory because we are walking in His Word and it brings life. Right, so we see that uh, the, the Shemitah is uh, part of this, the first portion of Leviticus 25 that we have read together this day. And remember, seven of the Shemitah, the seven-year cycles, uh, culminates into the 50-year cycle. So, on the end of the 49th year, it is a, the seventh year is a sh- sabbatical year, and you know what happens is that you don't, um, you don't sow the land, you sow the fields, you reap the harvest of last year. Part of that. But then next year, the 50th year, is the second year that you reap the harvest of the last, the, the 48th year. So there are two years of blessing that the Father gives us. And this is typically the, 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 the picture that we have in the Sabbath, when we, when Israel was in the wilderness, on the sixth day they picked up the manna from the from the fields from the ground, and they had enough for two days. So it's not um, it's not something to fear in the life of Israel to have a jubilee, to have a, a seventh year which there is nothing to harvest. It is the year that we know we can rely on the blessing of the Father, and we will have overflowing. Um, abundance in our lives. No? So it is, I think we are, we are approaching those same days because, um, because uh, there comes a time in our life that we are solely going to rely on the Father for His provision and, and um, well, we do it today as well, but I think um, as times grow more difficult and more challenging, I think these realities will increase in our lives and the Father is preparing us for that. So, so unfortunately in the life of Israel, there are times and periods where people fall into poverty and for different reasons they get into a place where where, um, they become enslaved because they can't pay their dues, they can't uh, make a living on their own and then they are taken into slavery within Israel. What is the reality of a slave in Israel? What does it look like? What do you think? Is that uh, because we've got a very negative connotation to slavery in our part of the world and uh, I think Slavery in the world system is something be, to be criticized because it takes away all the dignity of one's life. It takes away everything. But the opposite is true of a slave in the life of Israel because it's there to restore someone. It's there to take a broken person that was broken down through society and its, his experience into your household and to restore his dignity, his value, so that he can have a hope for someday that he can join the world again restored and renewed. This is the focus, and I think we, I think we see that in the seventh year cycle. We see that in the fifth year, the jubilee cycle, and um, so it is it's something that we can. This is part of the the our economical structure that the Father has put into place as a as a measure of protection for the lives of every believer of every person. So. So there is a there is a land up north, <clears throat> a beautiful place, a little bit of a harsh country, 
And um, that the Father has promised to each and every one of us. There is a place that the Father has promised that Israel is going to be restored to. And and Am Israel Chai, the life of Israel will be where the Father has, has uh, put them. And um, there is that piece of land, Israel, um, the land of Israel is really not the property of the people that lives there. And I think this is one crucial thing that, that one can easily and mistakenly overlook is that is that um, the Father puts us in a place where, where we are stewards of everything that He puts into our hands. And we need to be good stewards to glorify His name, to bring honor to His name. And it's not only for the land of Israel and the people of Israel that's living in the land, it's for you and I as well. We're living in George and the Father has put us into a place where we are not only looking for our own purposes and benefits and for our own own sakes and whatever, as we are part of a community and we should take care, good stewards of what he has put into our hands. And I think as time goes on and we we look at what's um, what's in the news and the news of tomorrow maybe, as these things are going to be more relevant in our lives and it's going to become more relevant in our lives. And this is an opportunity that the Father puts in our lives is to bless him and to bless each other and to be a light shining in the wilderness. You agree? I think this is, uh, as, we, as we are walking in these days and we are seeing, we are hearing the rumbling of storms on the horizon and all these things take place, I think it should be encouraging to us as the Father is bringing an opportunity to each of our lives that the freedom that He has planned, we can be part of that restoring and helping people to live that life. So, what is the purpose of a Levitical city? What, is, what does it talk about? What is that? What was that? The Levitical cities in Israel. What was that? It was a safe place. What? What? Uh, when? What happens? What is? Uh, when does it be? Uh, when does it become a safe place? When you when you walk in the land down the road, and someone crosses your path and he irritates you, and you respond to him you, by accident. <coughs> cause his demise and um, you didn't plan ahead for it, you didn't think it's part of your itinerary for the day, you know, sort of thing and you, then there is a place of safety because his fellows his brothers and his family are going to come after you that's what it is so then the father says that there is a, there is a place in Israel where you can find refuge so if you look at the context of this whole, this whole story, what is the context of this whole story? What is it all about? It is about the Father giving um, redemption, deliverance, a place of safety, and a place of freedom for His children. This is what the whole, this whole story is about. So I think in a, in, a, in a period of time, in an era of time where we're living, um, I read an article this day that says um, that um, they foresee that the 425 million people that's without food in the earth today is going to grow to 1.6 billion more or less in the next while. That is a very large portion of our of humanity. And how are we going to how are we going to take care of one another by embracing the principles that the Father has set? This is the only way forward. This is the only way that we can make a living. So, so I think um, this, is not, uh, this is not only spiritual knowledge. This is not only things that we can look at on a Shabbat or read about and trying to apply in our lives spiritually. The Father has given us principles where we can live by. And that's our challenge. All right, so, so how do we in difficult times, how do we in times of need go ahead as a family, as a community, um, helping each other, blessing each other, it is by putting your talents, the things that the Father has put into your hands, into your life, and we share it with one another to the glory and His honor. So that when people from the outside look in, they can see, wow, look at the love that there is within these people. Look at the, the principles that the Father has put into place for the blessing, for mutual blessing, so that His name may be glorified. And I think um, as the time goes on, this will become more pre prevalent in our lives. So, 
So, as a uh, Israelite slave, how long is the slavery of an Israelite? What is the length of days, maximum period of slavery for, for an Israelite slave? What do you think? It's one Shemitah cycle. Remember six years? The seventh year it goes free. So it is six years, the seventh year it goes free. But what can you choose? I think this is not part of t- today's Torah portion. What is in the, what is the possibility of an Israelite slave? What can he choose in terms of his livelihood, his things that he lives in the house that, of safety for these six years? He can choose to become a bond slave. He can choose to become, make a proclamation to say, I want to remain behind. I want to live in this house of safety where the Father has put me. And I think uh, we'll, we'll speak about it in the future. But, but there, is a per, there, there can be a permanency to, your, to um, your experience in the house. And that's where we are. We are bond slaves of the Father. And I think there's, there are so many... If you think about all the, the, the possibilities and the realities of what the Father's Word contains, it is, it's really amazing. So, so the central thought in all of this is when something happens in your life, when something happens in my life, where we find ourselves in a difficult spot, what is going to happen? Is the Father has put into place certain ways and measures so that we as a community can reach out into one another's life, and so that life can be brought forth from that, and that we can encourage one another and help one another to the way to find life again, to be restored and to live a life worth living. Agree? So... So I think uh, just a couple of ideas that I thought about is that um, if we look in, in the New Testament, I think it's in Ephesians where it says that in the Father's sight there's no difference between the free and the slaves, of Jew and Gentile, Greek. We're all together in terms of what the Father is, the, the way the Father sees us. So I think um, our, life, our lives in this world tends to make differences between classes of people. But that's not according to the Father's Word and according to His will. I think, um, I think if we realize our brokenness and if we realize the place that we are in and our vulnerability, then we would much rather em- embrace uh, those principles and set ourselves apart from the other people that we think is lower than us. You know? Because that is why the world is living the life that it is at the moment, divided communities and tension and pressure and all of this, is because of all the inequalities that has been taking place this last while. So, so one thing that we must realize is um, the time of our release. When is the next jubilee, by the way? Do you know when the next jubilee is? For sure. Not speculation, because every year... It's amazing to me uh, if I read different uh, articles. Apparently, for the last three or four years, every year is just about a jubilee, in different people's opinions. You know, so how many jubilees have there been in Israel's life that they have actually celebrated for the last two and a half thousand years? You know, how many, how many, how many in the life of Israel? How many jubilees have they celebrated? Zero, not one. They've never gotten to a place where they could reap the fruit of what the Father has brought for them. Why do you think that is? What is what is the preconditions for celebrating a jubilee? Israel must be in the land. First thing, Israel must be in the land. The whole Israel must be in the land. And we can't have it in a time of difficulty, in times of sin, of times of whatever. So it is... I think this is, there's a message in this. The only jubilee that we're really going to celebrate in the life of Israel is when Messiah comes. That will be the jubilee. And we are looking, desperately looking forward to the time where, Messiah, where the ram's horn is going to blow. When is that blowing, by the way? Do you know? When is the announcement of the jubilee? Yom Kippur. Yom HaKippurim. That is when the jubilee is announced. So, we are waiting for the return of Messiah, so that the, the ram's horn can sound and the year of release will be proclaimed. It's an interesting concept, because when you read the, 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 the Isaiah script portion in Nazareth, a while ago, about 2,000 years ago, 
What did what was the what was the Torah portion? What was the Haftarah portion that you read? Isaiah sixty, I think. Proclaiming the year of release. What is the year of release? What does it say? What what's the meaning of that? Jubilee. Ah, so the second portion of the of the text it says, and the vengeance of our God. You stop before that. Because he is making a proclamation to say, in him is the jubilee found. We can be released and redeemed and delivered and everything within him. But there comes a time still in the future from his perspective that um, the year of the judgment and all of this will take place, the vengeance of our God. So, I think I've got it forward, but all right. So if I if I come back to where Israel is at the moment at the mountain, they're experiencing a time that they have just gotten out of out of Egypt and they're now sitting at the Mount Sinai and they are on their way to the Promised Land, Baruch Hashem. Okay, so I think this whole time period that they were in the wilderness, those three elements were were part of their existence the whole time. They were prepared at the mountain. To receive the ways and the words of our Father so that they can be equipped to go into the promised land. Okay? So they received the Torah, they received the principles, the Mishpatim, they received Levitic, the whole of Leviticus, and then they move away from the mountain into Bermidbar, into the wilderness. And in the wilderness we know that they tempted the Father over and over and over, and they were purified through His discipline. And when they were sitting at the, at the border of right at the border of Israel, before they went into the, to um, Israel, under Joshua, there is a time of transition that takes place. They are now believers that were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and now they're going into the wilderness. Now they become the bold fighters, the bold people that are taking over the land of Israel and progressively. So I think in our, if you look at the ideas of 40, which is times of challenge and so forth, those three elements are part of, of the experience, all time. Those are our experience in this life that we're leading. The Father is preparing us to enter the fullness of the ideas of the kingdom. And as we go, different areas of our lives that are hardened and not plowed out, so that the word can find seed and grow, hardened the areas in our lives, we need to purify those. Those need to be, be prepared and purified, so that our whole being can transition into the image and of Messiah. Okay? That is our story, and that's the story of the day. You've actually hold, heard the whole story now. So let's just sit back and enjoy the ride. So so I think um what does it mean for Israel to be transformed? Is um remember where they come from? That same generation. They were slaves for many, many years, two hundred odd years in Egypt. Their whole culture, everything that they have adapted and a mindset. And you know what? If we live in this world, we are, we've been so ingrained in the value system of this world, so it's very difficult for us to extract our values and the things that we believe and our principles from the values of this world into the value system that the Father has set us apart in the kingdom. And this was their challenge as well. And we can see over and over they had failures in their lives. And the failures in our lives is similar to what they have. And um, it is ridding themselves from this, this idea of slaves and masters and different classes of people to seeing us all under the, from the perspective of our Father. And I think this is part of, part of the transformation that needs to take place. So, so, um, if you think about the economical system of today, there are some in the free world that's got a free world, uh, a free economic system, like we are the capitalism that we are finding ourselves. And is that a successful system? Is it working well? To the benefit of all people, of all its citizens, is that working especially well? I think, um, I think if you ask, I wonder if, if you would get different answers from different people. The very wealthy would say, yes, I think it's working very well. And the people that's in the middle class will wonder about the reality, and the people that's got lack will say definitely not. You know, so I think if we look at at uh, the free economic system, I think it's got its definite fa- failures and setting up for strife and all sorts of things. 
What about the what about the other side of the coin, the socialistic side, socialism? How does that work? You know, most of the the kibbutz systems in Israel is set up with a very strong uh, socialistic sort of uh, viewpoint. But is that the answer? Is that the answer if we look at the uh, socialism, the countries that embrace that system? It appears that brokenness and poverty and in, even inequality is still part of part of the everyday existence. So what is the Torah? What what is this, the Torah sort of the word of a father? What system does does that embrace? It's what do you think? What system does it embrace? It's a question and it demands an answer. <clears throat> what do you think? You're exactly right. Why? Because in the six years of the seven year Smita cycle, it's a free economic system. And the, the people that's, that's entrepreneurial uh, attitudes and they can see opportunities and they work their way forward, they can grow economically. And when people, others are getting, uh, are falling into slavery and they lose their lands, etc., they take care of them, they bring them into their household, but there's a reset. There is a time where the socialism side of the, of, uh, equal, equalizing, again, uh, the whole story, happens on the, on the seventh year. So, it's a combination of these two systems. So, the inequalities due to free world is, uh, that grows apart quite quickly is, re is um, restored in the seventh year. And the cycle repeats itself. And then the lands that are acquired by those that are cunning farmers, etc., in a 50-year cycle, that is reset. So that the generations will not fall into slavery, but they are reset and they can function in the, with respect and dignity and so forth with the Father. So, so I think... Just as a summation, I think, um, I think what we can, we, we do what we always do, is we focus on an area of our revelation that we get, and we focus only on that, and we grow in the direction, and we lose the balance. And I think the world has done it over and over in different directions and, and areas, and this is one of them. So, so I think um, the Torah, we can have both, but not at the same time, meaning that in the six years, we've got a free economic system. In the seventh year, when there's no harvesting, no nothing, we flow, we flow, to, flow together in a system where everybody just functions together. Okay, so, do you agree with me, or do you think I'm missing it here? What do you think? You think you think this is, this is sensible? I think it is. So... Um, a father's heart is so that everybody will be treated the same way, that equality will happen, you know, but, but in every case and in all cases, we need to have people that are stronger in a community that can help those that is not as strong. So that people can be encouraged and restored and can be educated so that they can be equipped to live a successful life. And this is part of the whole system. So, so one of the one of the qualities that we should have is love one another, respect one another. You know? Those things that we see back in Galatians five twenty two. If we live a life like that, then we will be successful. So So we are in a time of Omer at the moment. Which day are we in about? What day of the Omer counting is it about? I think we're at thirty five. It's day thirty five. This is yeah, I think so. It is uh, day 35 after 50 that needs to be counted. If you look at the Hebrew, Hebrew wording of that, it's vasefertem uh, lachem. So it is plural. The, the mem at the end denotes plural aspect of it. What does it mean? Why is it stated in the plural? Why do you think it says that everybody, you and I, every individual will count the days of the Omer? It is because it's a reality of equipping, of purifying, of preparing, heading to uh, Shavuot, and it's each of our responsibilities. Because it's a, it's a spiritual experience, which we apply in the physical. It says that you and I have got responsibility to grow in the, in the new kingdom lifestyle that has been revealed to us in Pesach, that we are now growing the leaven of the kingdom in our lives, so that when we get into two weeks' time from now, when it is two, three weeks, what is it, two weeks' time from now to Shavuot, we can present the two breads that has been permeated with the new lechem, the new leaven of the kingdom. 
That's our, that's our responsibility. But if you look at the counting of the years of the Shemitah and the counting of the years of the, of the um, Jubilee, it's counted in singular form. It is It's singular form. So why is this? Well, whose responsibility is it to come to here so that we stay in sync as a community, that we don't drift apart, that we don't argue about calendars and all those things that is prevalent in our sort of society. Thank you for that. So it is the com- it is the community as a whole, and that represents the community, so that we in unity as as one body can decide together, and we are led at the moment we are led by a by an international community, the Jewish people, the calendar that we are following, because a calendar is a, is an, an instrument that that sounds almost Afrikaans. <clears throat> it's an instrument that um, that we use for a community to flow together. So that we can celebrate the days of the festivals, the days of release, all of these things together in unity. So, the leadership and uh, things that have been put into place, and I think this will help us that every second person doesn't develop a new calendar, and there can be confusion and chaos and and division and all sorts of things that ensues into because this is part of the society that we belong to, our experience. You know, so I think there is a risk, but it's addressed in the word. And it's clear. Every person cannot decide on that. It is the purpose and the responsibility of a common body of people that says, these are the days that we walk in, and as long as it glorifies our Father and glorifies our Messiah and doesn't contravene the theological aspect, then we're fine. Okay. So, if we, if we walk through the, the festivals, the Moedim, just quickly, and we look, and look at it from the perspective of Day of release of jubilee of this, the of from that that perspective, and it's uh, remember the the reason and the principles and the purpose of the festivals is the footsteps of Messiah, and what does the Messiah do to you and me? Is it equips us with the word? It says in Ephesians, uh, the body, the the bride will be washed by the word by Messiah. Okay. So we are equipped and prepared so that we can live a life in the kingdom. And when we do, mis- do mis- make mistakes, and we do, then what happens? As we are purified. We can ask for forgiveness. John says, is the, Father is, uh, the Father is, will forgive you if you come to him and you ask him from, uh, for the sins that you have done. And then when we are forgiven, what will happen? You will be restored. And eventually, as we are growing and we walk along, we will be transformed into the image of the Son. You agree? So if you look at the, the, the Moedim and the principles that it's contained therein, it says, in Pesach we become part of the household by the covenant, by the blood of the Lamb and the doorpost of our heart. We become part of the, the covenant. So and then, in first fruits, the message of first fruits as we find, um, that, uh, that uh, Shaul writes, he says, um, because of Messiah that was raised as the first fruit of those that were risen from, from death, we've got a hope to be resurrected in the millennium. You and I, we've got a hope to be resurrected. So this is all good news. And Shavuot, we are equipped with the word and spirit so that we can live a life and become part instrumental in our livelihood of this day so that we can be a shining light in the darkness. Because we are equipped with word, and we are equipped with the spirit, so that you, when you go to your neighbors that doesn't know the Father at all, you can shine the light of the kingdom to them, and they will be drawn to the Father through your life. And this is the time of, this happens in the time between Shavuot and Yom Teruah, the time of summer, the time of heat in Israel, when there's no rains that's falling, time of difficulty. But what we are doing is we're bringing in the harvest of the land. That's what we are busy doing. So, we are equipped. What is the purpose of Yom Teruah? What is, it, what, is the, what is the message of the blowing of the shofarim? What is the message? The king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. And so what do we do? Is 
you repent of the things that you have done from Shavuot till now. The mistakes that we've made, the sin that we have done, the misunderstandings that we have done, uh, that we have been part of. So this is a call to repentance. Because from Yom Teruwa to Yom Kippur, there are ten days. Ten days of difficulty. Yamim Noraim, that's the days of all. The day van verskrikking. It is days that we uh, that we've been equipped for from Shavuot through those couple of months up to Shavu, up to Yom Teruah, so that we can walk a walk of righteousness in the presence of the Father. That when difficulty comes, we are equipped to go through the difficulty and be a shining light to the Father in the time, and so that His name can be glorified. But this is time of purification and repentance, and then we get to the place of Yom Kippur where our names are. Inscribed in the Book of Life and in, celeb- in Sukkot, we celebrate that we are more than conquerors in our Father and Messiah and we live a life in the Kingdom, in the presence of our Father and Messiah and it's a time of our joy. And uh, you see, eternity went very very quickly because Shemini Atzeret is the symbol of the new heavens and a new earth that is established and we, we can live a life in Eternity with our Father. Good. So, but what I want to focus on today is a part of that. And what we, what we see right in the beginning, the way this cycle begins is the day of Pesach. What is the date again? It's the day of 14th of Nisan, of uh, Aviv. It's right when we start out our, the cycle of redemption. This is where everything begins. And for seven days, it is the days of unleavened bread. It is days that we mimic the life of Messiah and that we put away the leaven of the old that we have been involved in the slavery to sin. And now we are um, aligning our lives with a sinless life that Messiah lived. And uh, somewhere in those seven days, there is the first, the, the, um, Rashid, uh, What's this, what's the right word? Bikurim is the first, the first of, feast of first fruits. Somewhere in there it is a, it is the day after the weekly Shabbat. And from there on forward, we count the 40 days. The 40 days until the resurrection of Messiah. The resurrection has taken place. This is the ascension. Thank you for the correction. So, it is uh, the date of ascension that we are counting off, 40 days, because uh, we are on our way to Shavuot, which is 50 days away from the day of first fruits. So, but I believe that uh, seeing that we are not at the day of ascension yet, I will speak about the first 40 days, okay, and the realities that's contained in that. So, I think this is, uh, seeing that I'm not going to speak on the day of ascension, this is now my opportunity. All right, so... Just just because I can. So, what about the 40 days? Let's think about 40 days. By the way, before we get... Let's do it now. Jubilee. Any Afrikaans is it? Jubel. Jubel. Jubel in Yeh. What, did, what connection do you have if you think about Jubilee? What what association do you do uh, make with this? English, Afrikaans. What, what's the, what words? Joy. Yes, what else? Freedom. It's all, it's all good things. Vreugde. Natuurlijk, vreugde. So, what is the, what is the word in Hebrew? Do you know? What is the, oh, I will have joy Exceeding joy, if I can find a crown. It is, the word in Hebrew is Yod, Bet, Vav, Lamed. What word is that? It speaks your, it's, it is Yovel. It's the word Yovel, and that's where the word Jubilee comes from. So, what does Yovel mean? What is the word Yovel? Because if we think about Jubilee, we think about the Freedom, unending, it's immeasurable freedom. Okay, so what does the word Yovel mean? It's the blowing of a trumpet. That's what it means. It's the blowing of a trumpet. So, 
When does a trumpet blow? When does a shofar when does a shofar him? When when do we blow a shofar? Okay, we blow it on a new cycle, a new month. When else are we commanded to blow it? When we are assembling the troops for war. Or when a prominent announcement is to be made to the assembly. So it could be for good, it could be for bad. This is it. It's a, this is what Yovel means. It's the blowing of a trumpet. So throughout the years, I think we have... Um, I wonder if I've got a slide about that. I can't remember. It comes from the Latin word, and uh, Yubilo. And it's, that's where we get the English and Afrikaans from. And it means joyous, exuberant joy. That's, what, that's where it comes from. But, but the day of Jubilee, the day of Yom Kippur, carries a good message for those that's found part of the household, not so good message for those that's found outside of the household. That's why on Jubilee it's a fast day. Oh, not uh, well. It's a, it is on a, um, announced on the day of Yom Kippur, so it's basically the same day. This is why the day of Yom Kippur comes with fasting. Why do we fast on, on the day of Yom Kippur? Because it's firstly it's an affliction for yourself, but secondly. It is because we have got compassion and we know that there are people that are not part of the joyous experience that we will find ourselves in Sukkot in a couple of days from then. Okay, so I think we, it's a day of, of humbleness, it's a day of compassion, it's a day of that the end of our days of repentance are there and we stand in awe and in respect and in humility before our Father. So, so then the 40 days that we see that's leading, that's part of this Omer cycle that we are from, from, um, Rashid Katsir, from Bikurim, from first fruit up to the, the ascension day is, is marked by preparation. It's marked by purification and transition. Okay. So that's where we are at. Right. Are you following me? Are we still on the same page? Examples. What examples of 40 do we see in scripture? Because so I think to understand where we are heading, we need to understand where we came from. So, the first period of 40 in Scripture, where do we find it? What is it about? Pardon? Yes, it's Moses. Moses, 40 days on the mountain. But just before that, a couple of years before that, we find the flood that Noah was part of. Okay? So, it rained for 40 days. Why raining 40 days? Why exactly 40 days and why is it recorded? It must paint a picture for us somehow. It's for the reason of purification they go through trial. Okay, so it is it is a measure of judgment, etc. That that uh, the the earth is subjected and the, and the the citizens thereof is subjected to. It's a judgment time because the earth is being cleaned or cleansed, so that the time of transition when when Noah puts his foot out of the ark again, he will step onto a new reality, a new earth, a changed earth. Okay, so 40 has got that element. So what's the next one that you see? Um, Moses. Moses had an exceptional 40 experience. He lived 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Midian, 40 years in the wilderness with Israel. Then he had 40 days on the mountain. He came down. He went back up for 40 days. He had, I think, six experiences of 40 because he is the one man that were prepared, purified, and transitioned. Above all, apart from Messiah. So Yeshua, had, um, when he started his ministry, there were 40 days of testing. Why 40 days of testing for Messiah? It's, uh, it was a time of equipping him and a time of transition. That he was, and remember, he was tested every day. So it was a time that he was prepared to transition from from growing up into priesthood and now for his ministry, ministry time, you know, or whatever the period was of his ministry. So for Messiah, I think uh, the 40 days of testing were, were prominent. And what about the disciples? 40 days after is the resurrection. What happens is Ascension Day. Okay, so, so what about that 40 days? in the life of the disciples, because they got to experience that 40 days. What was, what was their experience in the 40 days with Messiah? What happened in their lives? Okay. 
Okay, so filling with the Spirit. But what about the first 40 days? Remember the filling with the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit only took place in Shavuot, 50 days. What about the first 40 days? Yes, yeah, so Messiah appeared to them. I think Messiah appeared to them 10 times in, the time, in that 40-day in that period. And you are dead right. At the end of the 40 days, when he came to them on the mountain, he said, he breathed on them and they received the Spirit. Okay, but they were still waiting for the 50th day's equipping of the Spirit. So, I think in the, what happened to the disciples in that time is he spoke to them and they said, Yeshua, is this the time that you are going to establish the kingdom on the earth? They still had a wrong idea of what's going to happen. And that needed to be rectified. There was a certain sense of purification. There was a preparation that took place for his departure. And when he left, on the day of his ascension, they were not fearful anymore. They were not trying to fish anymore. They were not looking at their own things. They assembled as a, as a, as a united community in, in Jerusalem. And they trusted and they prayed for their equipping of the Spirit ten days later so that they can preach the world, the word boldly into the world. So, I think um, it changed from the earthly focus to a heavenly focus in, in, that, uh, in those days. So, so, let's think about if we can, if we look at the 40-day appearances, the, in that 40 days between um, resurrection and ascension, let's think, if we see the, the appearances, I'm sorry, it's a bit small, of uh, Yeshua to, his, to the people that he loved. First appearance was to Miriam. And the message to her is, Why do you seek the living among the dead? So, where should our focus be? What should our life, what should we do in life? What is our purpose? Is we should seek the living. We should seek life. And sometimes we, we miss it to a certain extent. And we walk around in, um, in desperation, seeking life in a place that it's not at. Because Messiah was resurrected, he was standing in somewhere else. So, what is the second uh, revelation of himself to? To the, to the people of Emmaus, the disciples to Emmaus. And um, I think um, as, he, as he walked on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him for who he was. But at the time where they sat down and he broke bread, and he explained the, the, the reality of Messiah, of his life from the Torah and the prophets, they had a revelation of who he was. So in the life of the disciples for them, firstly they got to know where they find life, and they've got a revelation of who he is, that he is the one that we were looking for. So, And in the life of Peter, he was, uh, in 1 Corinthians, it says that, uh, he appeared to Peter first and then to the disciples. So, um, and I think this is, this is compassion from our Messiah. Because Peter had the biggest hurt or wound of what happened in this time. And I think he doubted himself quite a bit after what happened at the crucifixion. So, as a display of uh, his compassion and his love to Peter, he, he appeared to him first. So, and it's a message of compassion and love and in, drawing nearer. What about the disciples in John twenty nineteen? It says that they were still they were in one room and they were afraid of of the persecution that was outside, which is perhaps an, a a message to us. Is um, yes, we are assembled and we our hearts are united and we pray for deliverance and redemption of our Father, but in the time that there are things happening in the earth that appears to be fearful, Messiah is standing in our midst. And he is saying, Shalom Malachem. Huh? Peace to you. And if we lose sight of that, if we lose sight of Messiah, of the spirit of Messiah that is in our midst, and walking this road with us, we can easily fall into a place where we are fearful. So, what about to James? What about James? What was the life of James like up to now? The brother of Yeshua. The brother of Yeshua probably living in Nazareth. What was his life like up to this point in, his, in time? Did he, was he a follower of Messiah? He was an unbeliever. He was a, he was a Jewish 
He was a, uh, a man of Judah, but he didn't believe that Messiah was uh, that Yeshua was the Messiah, and he didn't walk alongside of him. And it's amazing to me that Messiah went to to Yaakov to James, and he showed himself to him as in his resurrected state. And from there on forward, what happened to James? What happened in the life of James from that point on forward? He was known as a tzaddik. He became the, the leader of the community of Jerusalem. He became an, um, so outspoken for, for Yeshua. If, and one of, the, one of the things that is such a great testimony to me is read the letter. We're not going to read the whole thing. But just read the letter of James. Of James. How it starts. This is the only thing I'm going to read. James 1.1 1, 1. James, a servant of Elohim and of the Adon, Yeshua HaMashiach to the twelve tribes which are in dispersion. What does James say of his brother? The one that he didn't want to follow up to that point. What is the change in his heart? In his heart? Suddenly he, re he recognizes him as the Adon, the leader, the Lord, the Messiah, the one that they were looking for. Such a huge thing happened in his life just by the revelation of the resurrection that he got in his life. And um, this 40 days is a time period of revelation. And if we can get in our lives a revelation of who Messiah is and the awe of our Father in our lives, then this time of 40 days will be amazing in terms of the preparation for us for the times ahead, so that we can transition into a place where He wants us and we can be useful in the kingdom. So, after eight days, this all took place in what period? In what sort of length of how many days did this take place? Do you know? The next day after His resurrection. One day. And then after eight days, we see in the, f the first time of His appearance in John 21. So that was the first day, by the way. As I say, they were assembled in the in one place, and they were few, they were praying the disciples, etc. That was the day after its resurrection. But now, eight days later, in John twenty-one, he visits his disciples, and what were they what were they doing? Lovely, they were fishing, and um, and they revealed himself by saying that if you if you fish in the place that I'm going to tell you to fish, you will have a harvest of the nations. So. Preparing, equipping. And there was still one young man that didn't believe because he didn't see Messiah for himself. He didn't believe the message of the apostles. And Messiah says, says Blessed are those who have not seen me. And they believed. So who is that speaking about? It's speaking about you and I. So blessed are you and I. Blessed are you for believing who Messiah is, who Yeshua is, yet we haven't seen Him. Blessed are you when you submit your life to the obedience of the Word, of the Torah, of the whole world, so that we can find our life in it, and that we can, leave a li that we can lead a life where we can find the life and the light of our Father in belief and faith in what who Messiah is. So, And then in Acts 1 verse 3 to 11, you see that the disciples are awaiting the baptism of in Jerusalem, and um, they are sent to the ends of the earth. They are empowered, they are bold, they are going. And um, I think if we follow this, this trend, if we follow this trend of Messiah's equipping, even in, this, in that last period, um, this can be your portion and mine. If we follow this, if we spend time and... Look at what the Father is doing in this time of the counting of the Omer. Because this is the time where all of that happens. And we are living in a generation and in a time period where we, we are going to have to rely on the leading of the Spirit more and more and more. Because there is a deep darkness that is settling on the earth. So, on the day of ascension, they got to the mountain, stood on the mountain, and He blessed them. And in, the, in his blessing, he was taken up into the clouds. But where did he go? How do we know that he... What was his destination? 
to be with the Father on the right hand side of the Father, to be established in his priestly role, in his high priestly role, where he's functioning up to this day. And we see that Hebrews 9.24 says, Messiah has not entered into a set-apart place made by hand, like in the temple and the tabernacle, but in the true in into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Elohim on our behalf. But that's only the Hebrews, and we know that there are some people that dispute Hebrews. So let's read in Daniel. It says Daniel say, I continue to observe the night vision and look, someone like the Son of Man was coming. Where did he come to? Accompanied by the heavenly clouds. How did he how was he ascended? With the clouds? And he approached the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. This was the day on the day of ascension. This was when, when this take, was taking place. And to him dominion was be bestowed, along with glory and a kingdom, so that all people, nations and languages are to serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and it will never pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the day when the angels, when the heavenly hosts received Messiah back in the heavenlies. Now, if the heavens rejoice about the salvation of one soul, what do you think, what was that day like in the heavenlies? I think it, there was a little bit of joy. So, I was lying awake uh, one or two nights ago, and I was thinking about this occasion, thinking about when Messiah comes back and restored in the heavenly... Because remember, now he sits and he's restored and he comes into the heavenly sanctuary, into the role of high priest. He's established as, as, a, as the son of Elohim, restored in his glorified body, some, in a way that he never appeared in the heavens before. Because remember, before he came to earth, he was the living word in the heavens. He changed, coming back. His appearance changed because now he's a resurrected man. Remember? The son of the living Elohim. Okay, let's not go on that because I see you frowning. <clears throat> All right, so. So. I think, um, I think the, from that day on forward, Messiah is interceding for you and I. From that day on forward, Messiah is praying and is interceding for your preparation, your purification. And the fact that we can be transformed into the image of the Son. So, let's participate with Him. Let's walk with Him. So, if we look at the, the, uh, the sacrifice that took place on the day of Pesach, it was, it was a, a sacrifice that took place in an earthly sanctuary. Because all the from the from uh, a while after the establishing of the tabernacle, all lambs of all Pesach lambs had to be brought into the tabernacle, into the temple, where they were slaughtered and the blood was against uh, put against the altar, and they were taken home as a, as a, uh, as uh, a peace sacred peace offering, and we can be enjoyed by the whole family. Okay, so that's the way it worked. But that happened on the earth. So if we look at the climax of the Pesach sacrifice. When was the climax of the Pesach sacrifice? Where did this whole thing go to? What was, what was the, the real reason for the Pesach sacrifice? It transitioned from an earthly sacrifice into a heavenly reality where our Messiah's blood was put on the caparet into the heavenly sanctuary. So, and that took place on the day of ascension, I think. So, from the time of Pesach, it, it's, we are following the process, the trends. We are walking behind the Messiah. We are seeing the time of unleavened bread. We are recognizing him as the first one that was resurrected from death. And then we are, in our generations, we are being equipped so that we can see him as the one whose blood is sufficient for us, so that we can have redemption, salvation, purification, so that we can be transformed as part of the covenantal body into his image. So, so I think um, the day of ascension is an important day. It's a day in which Messiah was presented in the heavenly sanctuary as the high priest to intercede for you and I so that we can follow and that we can worship the Father and everything we ask in His name 
Everything that we ask in the name, in the power and authority of Messiah, the Father will answer us. That's our only access to the, to the throne room. So we can boldly go into the throne room, into the Holy of Holies. You agree? Only through the high priest of Messiah, our Messiah. You and I cannot go into the Holy of Holies at this stage, where we are living right now, apart from our prayers that are presented on the altar of incense in the heavenly, so that the smoke of our prayers can rise into the presence of our Father, so that we can have communication with Him. There will come a time that we will see Him in a closer relationship, but that is for where we are now. So, Okay, so there were resurrections. There were, uh, there were ascensions. I'm still at the resurrection. I wonder why. Okay, so the ascensions, there were three of them. Which three were there? Remember? Which, which one is that? Which, who ascended with a fiery chariot? Eliyahu Hanavi is, was um, ascended according to Scripture. Elijah went. You know, Enoch, was, Enoch, it says that he was no more. He lived in the presence of her father and, and he was no more. So, there was no method or... We haven't got a description of that at all. That's why I didn't include it here. But, uh, yes. So, there's one, one more and that is in the clouds. Who went into the inn with the Anan? The, what is the plural of Anan, Mariki? Do you know? Plural of Anan? Anim, maybe, maybe a male plural. Anim, maybe. So in the clouds he was taken up, ascended into, as we saw in Daniel 7.13, to the, into the presence of our Father. And that, and that mountains, who ascended on the mountains? We know that just before the death, when of, uh, death of Moshe, our Father said, climb into the mountain, and the Father buried him. Okay, so there is, there are those three, those, the, those three examples that we have of ascension. So, okay, so if we think about, uh, um, in, uh, about Elijah, it says that he ascended in a chariot of fire into the presence of our Father. And, um, unique opportunity, unique experience that I don't think anyone else had on that I know of is that the heavenly throne room sent the presence to the Father, to the, to earth, and he was taken away. And um, so, Yeshua into the clouds of heaven. What is different between Eliyahu and Yeshua in the, sen- is the ascensions of, that they experienced? Is you remember before, before uh, P- uh, Pesach happened, is, is um, Peter's uh, kefa. He, Peter said, I will not leave you and forsake you. I'm going to follow you all my days, and I'll pre- I will, I'm going to be there. And um, so, at the end, he denied Messiah three times. And this is the brokenness that Peter had to deal with, and I think that is the compassion why he appeared to him first. So, what about Elijah? You know that Elijah told Eli- Eli- Elisha to leave him three times. Stay behind, wait for me here. And he said, I will truly not leave you. I am going to follow you. And then Elijah said to him, If you, what is, what do you want? What is your, what do you want? And he said, I want to have a do- double portion of your spirit. And he said, If you look at me while I am ascending, you will have it. So he was following closely to the point of where Elijah departed. And, uh, what's interesting about Moses and Elijah to me is that both of that took place on the eastern side of the Jordan in the wilderness. You know, so it's so there's an interesting aspect to that which I I'm not sure of. So so Messiah was the actually the only one that that is that descended from Israel itself. So in Acts one six we see if we read Acts one six what is the what was the message what was the message in, uh, that Messiah brought at his ascension? What was his what did he tell his disciples to do? He says in Acts one six. When they'd come together and asked him, saying, Master, would you at this time restore the kingdom of heavens? We're still in that mode. He says, it's not for you to know the times, nor the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. The times and the seasons, right from the very beginning, there are things that set in place, and the Father has got control over those. He said, but you shall receive power when the set-apart spirit has come upon you, 
and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judah and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So where are you? What is the, your purpose? What are you to do from here on forward? And that's our purpose. Is that you will by, by, be my witnesses into the earth. Proclaim my glo- the glory of the Father in my name. And this is what you need to do. And having said this, while they were still looking, was taken up in, in a cloud. So, where did we see this before? In Matthew 28, it says, Yeshua came and spoke to them and saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven in heaven and on earth. Okay? So if we look at in Acts one six and we see where that comes from, we must remember this. It says, Therefore go and make disciples, make disciples of all the nations, immersing them in the name of probably in the name of uh Yotevafa Eloheinu, because that was the understanding of Matthew. But it's recording for us, recorded for us in the name of the Father and Son and the Set Apart Spirit. So I'm a bit hesitant to, I would, I would rather go that way. But anyways, it says, Matthew 28, 20 says, Teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. So if Messiah says in Acts 1, 6, when he was ascended, he said, go and make taught ones in all the nations. What does he mean? He says, teaching them to guard all the things that I have commanded you. And see that I'm with you always until the end of the age. So what's the message to you and I? If we look at, if we think about these days of the Omer, if, we, if we're looking forward to next week when the day of ascension, we are, we are thinking about the days of the day that Messiah was taken up into the heavenlies, He sends you and I out with a message. He says, be prepared to live a life worthy of the kingdom. Look at all that I have commanded you. Look at everything that I've been, that you've been commanded. Remember, one John says, says, it's not a new commandment that I give you, it's the commandment that you had right from the very beginning. The works that's been prepared for you. So live a life that's worthy of the kingdom by submitting our lives in obedience to the, to the words of Torah, but interpreting them through the impact of the Spirit in your life so that we can transform the letter of the Torah into a message of the kingdom. Okay? So... And see, I am with you until the end of the age. So if we think about um, our lives, we need to live a set-apart life, reach out to them in loving, in loving kindness. And um, remember I gave you this picture when uh, years ago when I was working at sea. Can you believe it? It's seven years ago. Anyways, so any maritime activity at sea is set subjected to rules and regulations. If you don't, there's chaos. So if we leave a port of, port of Richards Bay and we're going to Pakistan, or where we're going, wherever, we're doing it according to the instructions and the rules and the regulations that's of maritime law. But that's not our purpose while we're, while we're at sea. What is our purpose as a vessel? If you go to, to a foreign country, you carry a load. Remember? You're carrying coal. We are the same. Our purpose is to carry the, the load and the good news of Messiah. That's what we need to do. That's our purpose. That is what we do. We are not purposed to walk in Torah. We are purposed to carry the good news of the kingdom, the good news of Messiah. But we do it according to the framework and understanding of Torah. So if we don't, there's chaos. So... So, if we do that, and if we walk in, we walk in that way, the testimony of the nations around us will be the testimony of what they said to Israel. What a Elohim we serve. Look at the Torah that he has given them. They know exactly what to do. Because that is the grace that the Father has given us. So, so how, how effective are we in these days? to make disciples and to grow the message of the kingdom in our lives so that it draws all men unto the Father. How effective are we? And why are we not as effective as we want to be? I haven't got the answer for that. We need to find an answer for that one. I just, uh, I just know that we're lacking. I know that, I know that our message is not carried out to the nations as effective as it should be. 
And I think there are different reasons for that. And each, each individual has got a different reason for that. But I think it needs to be rectified. And that's part of the purification I think we need to experience in this days of the Omer that we are walking in. So, Patrick, you want to say something? <laughs> so, so, how do we equip ourselves for this task, this great and immense task? How do we equip ourselves for that? If we take the Torah as a list of to-dos and not to-dos, we're missing it. It's a revelation of the Father's character. It shows the compassion of the Father in our lives and how we should live a life that draws all men unto Messiah and unto our Father. So we should, it's, a, it's preaching to the choir, but it is the loving instructions of our Father for a life that we can lead in safety and in shalom with Him. That's what it's about. So, but it's got the elements for you and I. It's got the elements of equipping us for a life in the kingdom and what it needs. Uh, this in uh, Hebrews 11 says, if I do not chastise you, if I do not discipline you, you are not a son. You're illegitimate. So discipline and chastisement is part of the Father's dealing with us as a resp responsible parent so that we can be purified and that we can live a life with in the kingdom. So, So that term, going out in order to disciple, that idea, where is the first occurrence of that? Where is the first discipleship course in history, in, te in scriptures? Where do you think? Where does it start? And it's such a good place to start. Where, where does it start? Abraham. Yes, of course. Um, Abraham is, it is said that Abraham had to travel from Ur of the Chaldeans and he had to go, um, he had to go with his family up to the point of Haran, up to Haran. Where his, where his dad stayed behind and he said, leave your family, leave your land, leave everything and then go to a place that I will show you. Okay? Him and his nephew. And along the way he picked up a couple of people. So other souls joined his family and where we see that he goes back to find Lot when Lot was carried away with uh, the other Lot. So when... When, uh, when he goes to find his family, you can see he's got 318 young men as soldiers. Good discipleship program. He lived a life that showed the glory of the Father in the place that he lived, although they were pretty much hostile towards him. So, yes, he would, did that through hospitality. So, there's a challenge to us to live a life that draws people, that draws people to the message of the kingdom. And we can do that through various means. Hospitality is a very good way to do it. Because as we eat together and as we receive people and as we share a meal and as we involve them in our lives, it, is, it shows the Father's love and acceptance and respect to one another. So, Deuteronomy 4.6 if we look at the great commission that Messiah gave in Matthew 28, it says in Deuteronomy 4, 6, And you shall guard and do them. What is it that we shall guard and do? The words of our Father. For this is your wisdom and your understanding before the eyes of the people. So how do we live out the message of the kingdom? We live in the words of Torah because this is the wisdom and understanding before the eyes of the people. Do, they, do the people embrace the Torah at this stage? The other people? No, they're not. But they can see the they can see the, the values that's contained in it. So before the eyes of the people who hear all these laws, and they shall say, only the wise and understanding people this great nation is. So for what great nation is there which has an Elohim so near to it as Adonai our Elohim is to us? Whenever we call on him. So... I think it is this time, this, uh, this, the period that we are going through, the Father is calling us closer. He's calling us to stand closer to Him so that we can hear His words and so that our lives can be focused. You know, when we go out into our workplaces and we go about our daily tasks, is we can easily lose our focus. 
but in terms of our morality, in terms of our values, and the way that we interact with one another, in the way that we have compassion with one another, and all of we should never lose focus of the kingdom as far as that's concerned. So it's a challenge to go to your workplace and embrace that those values, but in terms of how we interact with people, that's always in the forefront. So in verse eight it says, And what great nation is there that has such laws and a righteous right rulings? Like all this Torah which I have said before you this day. So, so the last slide is, is as, as Messiah was ascended before them, and as he left and he blessed them while he was doing it, I think this is a reminder for us. It's a reminder for us. Because... Um, we can easily walk in these ways and we can look at the letter of the law and we can miss the bigger picture. You know? Interesting, exciting, wonderful, difficult days are ahead of us. But, the, but our Father says, look up, my friends, for your redemption is drawing near. There is a little bit of a transitional phase between today and that day. But it's, it presents an opportunity for us. It presents an opportunity where we can properly display the goodness and the mercy and the compassion of the Father in the values of the kingdom to one another and to the people outside so that the Father can be glorified. This is our challenge in this day. I don't know if I must... You know, you know if, if we look at the compassion and the heart of the Father in showing His character to us in such a detailed fashion. You know, some people look at it as being law. I look at it as grace. Because if we are to worship our Father, if we are to worship our Elohim, and we don't know the wrong from right, and we don't know His character, His ways, then we are I've got a, I've got excerpts of a of a of a, a communication of a sort of a prayer that a, that one of uh, it's an old ancient thing of someone in a pagan world. Let me just show you the hopelessness, what it means if we don't have the word that's illuminated to us or revealed to us. If we don't know the framework of where we should walk, where is our shalom? Where is the place that we should be in our Father? We don't know Him because He's not involved in our lives. You know, If you walk in that fashion, you're lost. There's no hope. There's no nothing. But the Father revealed His character to us through the Word. He sent His Son personally for redemption and deliverance. He involves Himself in our lives through the Spirit. He calls us and He's close to us. And if we call unto Him, He will answer. This is the end. It didn't happen. I had a slide. I think it's wisdom that it's not there. But it is, it's shown that it says, I call unto the God that I don't know. What have I done that's wrong because I don't know wrong from right? Forgive me my sins because I see that you are angry at me, but I don't know what I've done that's right or what's wrong. You know, if we don't know what's acceptable to our Father, and He has never revealed Himself to us, then we don't know what we're doing. But our Father has been so gracious to us to reveal His Word, reveal Himself through the Torah for us. So let's take those the, those basic principles, those values, the, His character traits that He shows to us, and make it ours, so that we can be transformed from where we are now into transformed into the image of His Son, because that is the values of the Son. You agree? So any questions? Any yes. Can I give you a mic, seeing that you would like to make a comment? Okay, so I just want to make a, a small comment on the first fruit feast, where you say it's the, it represents the hope of resurrection. I think it's more than that. The first fruit uh, festival is where the, it gets presented to the Lord and He accepts the harvest. Yes. We are the harvest. Yes, so right. I want to say it's more than a hope. I think it's a surety. Yes, it's definitely. Thank you. This is why Paul says this is our only hope because the evidence of the resurrection, the evidence of Messiah being the first part of the of the 
of the harvest. If that part is set apart, then the whole lump is set apart. So I totally agree with you. Thank you. It is um, it's because of the resurrection of Messiah, we are assured of what's going to take place. And our hope is firm, and it's established, and it's true. Thank you. Anything else? I think we are um, in a time period in our lives that our dependence, utter dependence on the Father and His His compassion and His love and His kindness is increasing dramatically every day. And, um, and the reason why we are in a community and the reason why we are living in this place is to show His love and His compassion and His life to one another for the purpose of shining a light to the people around us. So as times get more desperate, we should have the hope and assurance that our Father is with us. Remember when Moses was in the, when Moses was, when, when the Father was slightly upset with, with the nation for going after the golden calf and he said that I'm not going with you, you can go to the promised land on your own. Moses said, we are not moving one step from this place without you going with us. And may that be our, our prayer and our commitment to the Father is that we remain until He says we go. And because we have a relationship with Him and we hear His word and we study His word and we have a revelation of His character, there is a firm assurance that He is with us, His Spirit is with us, and that we hear His voice. And if things are happening in the world which causes fear, Baruch Hashem, is it's an opportunity to display His love and His life to the people around us. Tanirina. I just want to um, say, Amelia has had the go to go to Isra. Mm, yes, so. we'll say goodbye to her next week. So, Amelia is... Uh, has a has an opportunity to shine a light in a place where light is needed. So we'll pray for next week. Next week, no? Yeah, that's great. Okay. All right, anything else? Father, we thank you for every opportunity that you give us. Every and any opportunity that you give us to shine the light of the kingdom in a dark world. And Father, where darkness and, and hopelessness is the theme song of this world at the moment, and it's increasing, Father, may your light shine through us brighter and brighter. Help us in this time, in this, this time of the 40 days, Father, where we are heading towards and we are remembering the ascension of Messiah, Father, help us to be firmly equipped, prepare our hearts and our lives, Father, to live a life worthy of the kingdom. Purify it in areas where we need purification, Father, so that we can be transformed into the image of the Son. Thank you that you have equipped us with your word and with your spirit. And thank you, Father, that your, wo your still voice is within us. Father, give us the grace and the mercy so that we will hear your voice in every decision and in everything that we do. Father, thank you that we do not make decisions in, out of fear, but, Father, that we are motivated by love and compassion, and uh, we, we are motivated by your love, Father, to do the works of the kingdom in the time that we live. Help us to stay focused. Help us to stay commitment to committed. Help us to stay loyal to your kingdom. We thank you, Father, for your love and your compassion that you have invested in our lives. In the name of your Son. Amen.